Interviewing is an art form. And it's a leadership talent. You might not think of it that way, but it takes a bunch of skills and a lot of practice to become an empathetic and insightful interviewer. Today, on part two of my conversation with audio branding host Jody Krangle, we talk about the surprising challenges she faced as she grew her podcast. Jody is a very experienced voice actor. She's used to saying other people's words. She's not a journalist. Today, Jody shares the kinds of skills she had to learn on the job, like taking control of a conversation, listening deeply, standing in for the listener, and especially thinking on her feet. So, storytellers, if you conduct interviews, and I know you do, listen all the way through this bonus episode. You'll learn more about why sound matters, and you'll definitely come away as a better interviewer and probably as a better leader, too. Welcome to Sound Judgment, where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved host. I'm Elaine Appleton-Grant. Storytellers, my conversation with Jody has been broken into two parts. Today's is part two. It's fine to listen to it on its own, but you may want to go back one week and listen to part one. Jody is also running both of these episodes on her very fine podcast, Audio Branding. Do you know we have a free Sound Judgment newsletter full of guidance on how to make great creative choices in audio storytelling? Join subscribers from NPR, PRX, PRPD, Stanford, Spotify, and more. Visit podcastallies.com to subscribe. The link's also in the show notes on your favorite podcast app. Now, let's get into it. I was very taken. I was listening to, you do two-part episodes. I was yes. listening to episodes 77 and 78. Yes. Tom Edenson. Yeah. Thank you for pronouncing that for me. Yes. I really appreciate it. You saw me go, <laughs> I don't yeah. know how to say it's this. It's spelled strangely, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's Edenson. Yeah. Yes. And he is the CEO of Pirate, Pirate Branding, Pirate. I it's can't think of the name of it. Pirate Studios, I think. Pirate um, Studios? They Sorry. do a lot of really interesting things in that they um, they do audio branding as well as just straight producing of commercials and whatever else they're doing there. And Pirate Studios in downtown Toronto is actually a really uh, popular place that a lot of my voiceover colleagues have been to, and including myself. So it, it's, a, it, it's a wonderful place to be. And they've actually just made a new office. They've actually completely moved somewhere else and built it from the bottom up and, and it's looking beautiful. Yeah. Ooh, that is like, you know, as a, as a sound person, I just covet, you know, a studio yes. built from the ground up. Yeah. Um, what I found really interesting was you asked him a very simple question, which was, why does sound matter? I mean, you know, the backdrop is, big companies will spend millions coming up with the right tone that plays after you swipe your credit card or the, uh, you know, the jingle that always plays, you know, at the beginning of a commercial or choosing a particular voice talent among many auditions. Um, and you asked him why it mattered. And, and do you recall his answer or how you would phrase his answer? I know that he talked about um, how it's a, a deeper connection with the audience. And I, I have I have spoken about this in many other uh, of the podcasts that I do. It's all about emotional context. And he also mentioned that whole, we don't buy with logic, we buy with emotion. And so, you know, it's um, a way for people, I, I think he, he worded it as uh, to s make sure that you are um, going beyond the product itself. So you're selling something unique, distinct and ownable, and your sound should reflect that. So it's one of those things about building a, a company DNA and that the sound is a part of that. Yeah, 
And, and yeah, unique, distinct, and ownable. And he said that sound plays a very important role in creating something that is unique, distinct, and ownable. And that ownable thing really stood out to me because it was part of a larger discussion that he said about how people don't buy based on product or service anymore because Mm -hmm. there's so much competition. They buy based on the relationship you build with them and how they feel about you. And that's why sound is so important. Is that how you define, you know, the importance of sound in audio branding, in advertising, marketing, in human behavior? Yeah, that's definitely a big part of it. I would also say that um, part of what he might also be referring to is the fact that a lot of people tack on license-free music from a directory and think that they've got an audio brand. And they don't. (laughs) I mean, because the bottom line of that is, again, when he talks about ownable, yeah, you have a license to use that music, but so does your competitor. So does someone in a completely different industry from you. So you don't really, quote, own that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really Mm -hmm. yours, which is why having an audio brand, something that is specific to your company that was made specifically for you that can age and change and uh, uh, transform as your company transforms and stay with you over time. That's why that's so important because your clients, your customers, the people who are familiar with you know you as a certain thing. And if you change, what's that one thing that they're going to still relate to as you change? Mm -hmm. And I would say that there's a combination there. You know, definitely your logo could go through a transformation, but your sound can also go through a transformation. And your Mm -hmm. sound is that emotional context that I've referred to many times. So Mm -hmm. it's that emotional connection. And and yeah, I think he's come across many people who said, oh, let's put a sonic logo on it. And, you know, and they'll come up with like a five note mnemonic for no reason over a Saturday (laughs) and, and, and then never use it. Because it had no logic behind the creation of it. There was no reason for it to be. (laughs) Well, and that is also something you asked before about common problems with new podcasters. And this is true of companies and organizations. They can be very large, very well-funded organizations. It Mm -hmm. doesn't really matter. They'll say, we want to have a podcast. Well, why do you want to have a podcast? Well, because everybody else has a podcast. (laughs) Yes. Or because we want to get our message across. Well, that's not a podcast. That's an ad. Go buy ads on somebody else's show. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, or, Or they simply don't really know. They think it would be a good vehicle, but they don't really know. And, um... And therefore, it's very hard to make us succeed, which is, he was talking about the same thing with a mnemonic. Yeah. So that's uh, basically like five notes, like a sonic logo. That's kind of what he's referring to. But if you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, why a brand should have an audio brand, like why should a brand have a podcast? (laughs) And, and what I was taken by is that they go through this very detailed strategy work up front so that there is a rationale behind the music you choose. Um, I actually worked with a sound designer to choose the music for my show, Sound hmm. Judgment. And it's that was more than really the music, interesting. Though. Oh, it's way more than the music. That's yeah, just a yeah. little tiny piece of it. Mm-hmm. And so like when I work with organizations, it's a ton of strategy first. It's wrapping your head around, you know, why, what, for whom, what's the tone? What do you want this to sound like? What are you trying to communicate? How does it, how does it work with all your other communications? That's a good one. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and are you doing the level of quality of your other media, whatever you're putting out? It could be blog posts. It could be uh, ads. It could be anything else that you're doing. And because this doesn't happen as much as it used to, but even just a few years ago, podcasting was so new and so hot that even big organizations with 
very well thought out, beautiful professional communications work would say, oh, sure, to the intern, you want to do a podcast? Go do it in the basement. It's fine. Go do do whatever you want. And that's a really bad idea. Like it's well, better yeah. to not have one than to have it take away from the brand that you are trying to communicate. Exactly. Yeah. And the same thing happened with audio branding until really up until MasterCard started really making it a big deal. Actually, MasterCard did a, a whole audio brand. I don't know, maybe it's like three or four years now. Um, mm -hmm. And really, until I heard about that, um, and uh, uh, Gary V did a bit of a thing. I think in, he started talking about this in 2014. I know that it was a thing before that. And and I know like there were people that were doing this before that, but it was not a going concern the same way the podcasts weren't really a going concern up until, you know, maybe a couple of years before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then it started becoming a, a much more going concern type thing. But the same way that you were you were saying, oh, yeah, OK, let's have a podcast and the intern can, intern can do it in the basement. That's kind of how they thought of audio branding at the beginning, too. Oh, let's just stick a Sonic logo on this and play it right. everywhere. And that's how it'll right. work. Right. Right. <laughs> but that's not that's not really how you can take the most advantage of having an audio brand. There's so mm -hmm. much more to it, just like there is so much more to having a podcast. Right. And being a great host. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, I am curious, Jody, what over, as we, as we said, it's been a couple of years and you've been mm -hmm. both consistent and prolific, which is quite a feat. You should be very proud of yourself. <laughs> um, no pod fading for you because you're very organized. I'm also um, stubborn. <laughs> and stubborn. Stubbornness helps a lot. Yes. Yeah, we should talk about what mindset helps with all of this. Mm. Um, but I'm curious, what have you learned about yourself hosting this podcast that you didn't expect to learn? Mm. And, and I definitely want to ask you the same question because I think that's a fascinating question. Uh, as far as myself, I didn't think that I was a speaker of any kind. I mean, I thought that I would be, I mean, voiceover, I'm used to having a script, right? Someone gives me mm. a script and I'm used to reading someone else's words and making them seem like they're my own, which right. I can do. That's what I'm hired to do. I've been doing this full time for 15 years. So wow. it's something uh -huh. I can do. But actually speaking my own words and making them sound like I can that someone should care about them, for instance, mm, and, mm -hmm. and having a podcast where I'm hoping that someone is going to care about what I'm speaking about, and being passionate enough to get that thought across is a lot more work than I thought it would be. But it's also really rewarding. And, mm. and that's kind of what keeps me going as well, because I'm pretty passionate about what I talk about. And I like getting that across to people how I get that across has been something I've had to learn because I say ums and you know and like yeah. and all of these things very, very often. <laughs> and it's something that I definitely need to train myself more on. I don't think I will ever be perfect as far as that is concerned. And, and a lot of us, I think, go through the same issue. But being able to speak my mind on the spur of the moment as a host asking questions about what I am curious about and being an active listener in the moment when I'm talking with someone, that is something that I've had to learn because being a host is very different from being a guest, as you probably know. Yes, yes <laughs> and, it is. Yeah. So not only do you need to lead the conversation, but you need to ask the questions that you think your audience would want to know the answers to. Yes. And that becomes a skill very much a skill. And it's a skill that I will probably never stop learning. <laughs> I think that is, you just hit the nail on the head that there's no end to the learning. That's a big mm. part of why I started this podcast is because I, gosh, I've been, you know, reading about story structure and leads and writing 
since I was, I don't know, 15 or 16, I'm from mm-hmm. a family of journalists. My father had an ad agency and a sound studio in our basement. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah. To up yeah. With. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it was small, but, you know, I th- this is not, this was in the DNA, I guess. Sure. Um, but I've always been, you know, I've always read everything I could get my hands on about writing and then, you know, audio storytelling it's it's a little surprising that i've never really made the leap to to video but i'm happy here um (laughs) i agree yeah yeah um and and so part of it just came from my own like what can i learn from these people who are so varied so different in their Mm -hmm. talents in their tone their style their content and yet they're magnetic to their audiences. I love learning this stuff. So the passion I can see will keep me going for a long time, but the learning never stops. You can always improve. So true. Both of these, both of these skills. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. It's, it's something that never ends. Um, and yeah, I, I don't see an end in sight. I mean, 160 episodes and I'm still going and I still have people to talk to. So yeah, I mean, it just, it, it kind of never ends. Um, but yeah, there are some, probably you've come across this, there are some universal qualities and, and, and skills that go into what you talk about with the hostiness. And, and mm-hmm. um, did you define that before? I, I don't know if we, if you actually said I what I may that not was. have answered your question. Well, because... <laughs> It's okay. We've been all over here. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and and uh, this is why a, a framework script is mm. so helpful. Yes. Um, but um, I did not answer the question of define hostiness, because if you look in Webster's, it's not there. Mm. Um, the story that I have about that word is that I put out on LinkedIn that I was working on a project, I didn't say what it was, that was going to be looking at the qualities of beloved podcast hosts. And John Barth, who we talked about earlier, wrote to me, I did not know him and had met him once, and said, oh, we used to talk about hostiness all the time at PRX. And I said, what? And so when I got a chance to interview him, I said, what is this made up word? And he started to laugh and he said, what is hostiness? That must be why we talked about it all the time. Because it's sort of like saying, what is star quality in Hollywood? Well, you know it when you see it or you feel it or you hear it, but you can't say it's the same thing with everybody. What he arrived at is It's that feeling that when you meet somebody that you never want the conversation to end or that you see them on stage. Perhaps he said you see them on stage and you never want that performance to end. You're just, you just want to be there. I think it is a combination of many things and my quest with sound judgment and it, and it is a, it has become a quest is to try to identify some universal qualities so that we can say hostiness is made up of these 10 things. They look different for different people. So for instance, one of them that is readily apparent to me, even just after a very short season, is or maybe many, many years in radio. Um, I'm sure that helps. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't doesn't hurt. Yeah. Um, Is the ability to provide psychological safety. Ah. Both to your guest or your sources, right? In narrative Mm -hmm. nonfiction, you may be talking to many, many people, but they're not guests you're you're researching or reporting. Um, And actually to yourself as well. Because if you as a host don't feel safe, you're going to be unnatural to get Mm -hmm. back to that whole thing. Uh, So that's, and people do it in very different ways and for very different reasons. You know, when 
Stephanie Whittle's Wax of Last Day, who that is a narrative nonfiction, uh, very emotional podcast that deals with substance abuse and suicide and guns, goes to interview a couple who lost their son Mm -hmm. to suicide by a gun. The ability to create psychological safety with that couple, the skills involved, the way they go about that, and I say they because there's a team in that case, is very different than the psychological safety that, say, Anne Bogle, who's the host of What Should I Read Next, offers to, you know, the the mother and daughter pair who are, you know, 50 and 80 coming on the show to say, what should I read next? You know, here's what I've read for the last X number of years, and I'm looking for a new book. Totally different. But the quality, the need to build that relationship yeah, appears to me to be universal. Sure. So many different ways to, to go about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that's one. Another is that genuineness. You know, I am who I am. I'm not trying to be Ira Glass or trying to be <laughs> Walter Cronkite or whatever. I'm, yeah. I know my own voice and I can be comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we hear that, you know, like yeah, and and um, considering when we hear that in a voice, um, because uh, that kind of leads to another question, in that we create deeper connections with our voices, but are there voices that we trust more than others, and and why would that be? So you know, knowing yourself and being able to get across the idea that you are genuinely being yourself is probably a big part of that. (laughs) But I'm curious if there are others that you might have come across. I love the question. Why do we trust some voices more than others? And, you know, that is, that is a question that I'm going to add to my quest to (laughs) define hostiness. Honestly, because When I think of very famous hosts, Mm -hmm. and they may have started in radio and, you know, their shows have become podcasts. Ira Glass is an obvious one. Terry Gross is perhaps the most famous of hosts that way who we trust. Uh, There are other hosts who, you know, some people absolutely adore, but others, you know, find grating, uh, like Krista Tippett of On Being you know, has been on the radio and in podcasts for 20 years or so. And she's beloved by some and others are like, oh, I just can't even listen. Um, And so part, you know, there is a certain amount of beauty in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. There's also another really important question, which just gets more important by the day. And, And this goes right back to trust is who's the listener and where does culture and race and ethnicity and age come in? Mm, Good questions. Right. So, um, you know, I have a very close friend, Denise Soler Cox, who is a filmmaker and she's had a podcast. She's a public speaker. Um, and she is Latina Mm -hmm. and she talks about, well, the name of her film is Being Enya. And an Enya, in her definition, is someone who was born here but has at least one parent who was born in a non English speaking country, in a Spanish speaking country. And it is a very large and very rapidly growing population of people from all over any Spanish speaking country, from Mexico to Spain to um, you know, the Caribbean, you, you name it. And, um, it's not a monolithic group. They often get treated that way. And so more and more, we're wanting to hear voices that speak to us. So, you know, I interviewed, um, 
I interviewed Pavel Martinez from a show called Kin to Eres, which means who are you? And his, he is, um, I believe he was maybe born in New York, raised in New York, but he's Dominican of Dominican descent. He would be an Enya. Mm -hmm. And uh, his show is for Latinx professionals and everything that they go through. And he's speaking very directly with them and for them. And, you know, if I tried to have a show about the same topic for them, they would laugh me out of the room. Oh, right? of course. Like yeah. I have no credibility whatsoever. So I think that there is a piece of that that is very cultural and very important that mm -hmm. we don't really talk about that much. Well, I love that podcasting is going there, right? Podcasting can go there because there's, yeah. you know, anyone can get involved. It's one of those things that diversity of voice is is needed and and craved. And people like to, just like they like to see themselves on screen, they like to hear themselves in radio and in podcasting. So I think that the whole wide world is open as far as podcasting is concerned. And I love that about the medium. And definitely this is something that is filtering into voiceovers as well, because now you're hearing a lot more devo diverse voices, you know. Um, I, I, yes, I'm, you know, I, I present as a white woman, you know, in mid age, you know, like it's so, so there's a lot of me out there, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but there, yeah. there could be less of me and, and it would not take away from the fact that, uh, you know, other people should hear themselves, it, you know, that I, I'm not worried that I'm going to get less work. Let's just say. That I, I, you know, yeah. I, that's not the issue for me. The issue is that I want everyone to be represented so that they can recognize themselves and then go out into the world feeling proud of who they are, because that's important for all of us. It is absolutely, it is, it is crucial for all of us to mm -hmm. be able to be empowered and act in the world and to, you know, we are rapidly becoming in the U.S. a uh, majority minority country. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that'll be like by 2050 or so. And so, you know, a lot of this is following the culture, following the demographics. And yeah. I mean, there's a lot to say about that, of course, but. Well, it's not um, a zero sum game, right? Like, it's, like oh, just because God, no. someone else has more doesn't mean I have less. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, no, <laughs> like that's. No, no. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a big, I, I, that's a big issue. I think a lot of people are, are coming to terms with that, that you know, they, they need to pay attention to that. It's a very big issue. I mean, it's a big mm -hmm. issue in, in Hollywood, you know, and, Definitely. and also just gender, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember, you know, in my thirties, I did some voice talent coaching and went on some auditions. I mean, I never took it seriously the way you have. And at the time, I remember people still wouldn't hire women very much because oh, yeah. if there needed to be authority, the conventional wisdom was, well, a male a man voice, has to do that. Yeah. A man has to do that. Yeah. And I don't remember, I, I remember being so unconscious at the time that it was just like, oh, okay, that's too bad. <laughs> well, you know, luckily... I assume. I mean, has that changed in the voice? It definitely business? has changed. Yeah, there are more women doing promo. There are more women. When I say promo, I mean like announcing TV, mm. uh, you know, um, on the TV, on the channels, saying what show is coming up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like you, you would never, it, you know, years ago, you wouldn't hear women doing that at all. And now wow. they are. Uh, it, yeah. So I, I mean, it depends on the network. Generally, you have a feel of a voice for a feel of a network, right? So you kind of go that goes hand in hand. That's a lot like audio branding, right? Yeah. But but they never would hire women for trailers. And, you know, anything healthcare related, normally it was like they wanted the doctor voice, right? They didn't mm -hmm. want the nurse voice. The nurse right. And the voice, doctor right? voice, the yeah. doctor voice was defined as like a middle-aged white man exactly. or older, right? Yes, exactly. Marcus Welby, back yes. in my mother's day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or car commercials. Like you would never hear a, a woman on a car commercial. And now th that happens all the time. Not, not as much as we 
we would wish, right. <laughs> but it right. does it does happen a lot more often than it used to. So there are industries. Tech is another one of those, right? You normally you wouldn't hear a lot of women on tech commercials. Now you're mm -hmm. hearing a lot of millennial and younger women on tech commercials, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot going on there, and I think it has to do with. The fact that the current buying generations want authenticity in their voice and less put on, right? Mm -hmm. So that becomes <clears throat> that becomes less about um, uh, gender and more about who am I hearing that sounds like me. That's exactly right. And this was very interesting. Was it NPR and I believe it was Edison Research teamed up in 2021 and they did a big research study and focus groups about why people listen. And across ages, the number one reason is multitasking. It's exactly what you were saying before. While I'm washing the dishes, I'm walking the dog, I can listen. Yeah. Um, but, and, and also a commonality was to learn new things. But when they looked at younger listeners, which is the fastest growing group, I think it was probably 18 to 34 or something. Um, they had a few very distinct and very interesting reasons. One was to get fresh perspectives that I can't find anywhere else. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean maybe it means I'm finally getting this, you know, perspective of what it's like to be a Latinx professional in the corporate world mm -hmm. and how hard that is. Well, that's a perspective I'm not hearing somewhere else. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, there's a lot of it, it's, you know, very segmented, right? You can hear, you know, well, I'm hearing all about how sci-fi novels are written just because I'm a sci-fi fan, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the fresh perspective, a sense of belonging. There's a sense of I'm in, I'm in the community with you. Mm -hmm. It's that with, with part. And I feel seen. Someone yeah. understands who I am. That is they so sound important. like me. They talk mm -hmm. about what I'm interested in. That was just, I mean, it just gives me chills to think about. Definitely. Yeah. And it's so important because we all need to be seen. We all need to feel like we're a part of something. You know, I mean, most people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I won't say everyone, but most people. 99%. Like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's a very tiny group. Yeah. Yes. There's we, no we all universals here, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I wanted to ask you what you are working on now that you can talk about. Yeah. Uh, I'm working on a bunch of different things that are so interesting. I've had some wonderful interviews that uh, by the time this airs may have aired on Sound Judgment already. One I referred to before, which is Glenn Washington, who is the host of Snap Judgment, uh, who Snap Judgment has been on the air uh, across 500 public radio stations since 2010. Oh, wow. And it's a podcast as well. Mm -hmm. And he gets something like 2 million listeners a month. One of the single best storytellers I have ever heard. What was interesting about him is he told me a great story, which I won't divulge here. <laughs> we'll have to listen. <laughs> you'll have to listen. That the word hostiness literally changed his life. Oh, wow. Okay literally changed it. My jaw dropped. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned my interview with Jay Bear. That one was fascinating. Another one, here's, a, here's something that I did not expect about doing sound judgment. And that is where some of these interviews go. So I interviewed recently, um, a host of a cooking show. And Interesting. Yes. So much fun. The prep made me very, very hungry. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine. Looking at all the Instagram <laughs> pictures. Uh -huh. And um, her show is not active right now. In fact, it stopped a year ago. I thought I knew the reason why. And it was a very, you know, sort of mundane, like, well, new job kind of reason. Mm -hmm. And the day I spoke with her, she told me about the death of one parent and the impending death of another. 
And we spent a lot of time talking about grief Mm -hmm. and the intersection of our real lives with the work. And, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things I didn't expect was how very quickly these conversations get deep because what I've come to believe is what we bring to the mic is our humanity and how comfortable we are with it Mm -hmm. and whether we can embrace all parts of it and whether we can help other people embrace all parts of their humanity. And so what I thought was going to be a very surface level kind of like, let's talk about cooking show hosts turned into something incredibly different and astonishingly moving. Those are the best shows, the ones that come out unexpectedly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll look forward to hearing that. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about you? What are you working on that you're excited about? Uh, Well, I'm going to be actually doing a talk in PodFest, which by the time this comes out will already be done. (laughs) But uh, we're going to be talking about how to supplement promoting your podcast on social audio. So things like Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces and LinkedIn Lives and things like that. So Yeah, it'll be a really interesting conversation. Myself and three other panelists, I'm going to be leading a chat kind of like I do in my clubhouses. (laughs) And you have been extremely uh, busy with social audio in addition to producing this great podcast. And it's been really impressive to see building a community and leading, you know, a variety of these conversations. And I think I've dipped in once or twice, but I always <laughs> intend to get there more often mm-hmm. and to and to try it myself. You know, it's one thing to be behind a mic and it's another thing entirely to be sort of out there live. Yeah, it's a different kind of hosting. It's kind of like, a you know, um, uh, put the question out there so that people can start a conversation not just with one person, but with multiple people, which, you know, then becomes a moderating kind of job, because then you kind of need to, you know, is someone taking too long? Are they not saying enough? Do you need to prompt them more? You know, is there more that could be said? Do you need to take a question from the audience? You know, this kind of stuff. So lots of other things going on while you are in that conversation. So it's teaching me a lot. And I think that my lessons from being on Clubhouse will help me do the panel in PodFest. So yeah, that's going to be an interesting, we'll see how they relate. (laughs) I'm getting a lot more comfortable with it, let's say. (laughs) Well, there's a lot of thinking on the on on your feet. Yes, yeah, there is. Right? And and I think that's something that comes somewhat naturally to longtime journalists, right? Because we don't know what to expect in many many situations, in most situations. Sure. Yeah. And, For me it's it's yeah. something brand new though. That's something that I've had to learn you know, as I, as I do this. So yeah, there's a big difference between scripts and not scripts. (laughs) Very much so. (laughs) Very Very much so. Yes. So I, I'm learning what it means to be off the cuff a lot more than uh, I was when I started this, let's just say, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but I'm going to be away for a little bit and, uh, and taking a bit of a break from clubhouse and from producing the podcast while I'm away. So I'm just sort of gearing up for that little holiday. And PodFest is happening at the end of that holiday. So large um, podcasting convention that I'm hoping a lot of people who are listening may actually go to, uh, or have been to in the past. And um, it's quite a a gathering of family, actually, I, I really enjoy being with the people there. Yeah, so the, po- the podcast people are are really wonderful. They yeah. really, really are. It's fantastic. Um, but yeah, and there's... you are also getting your jazz band together. Ah, yes. Right? Yeah. Well, we haven't done that in three years, and so part of the trip that I'm doing is to sing with a nine piece jazz swing band at a music conference that I haven't been to in three years. And so traveling across uh, the U.S. to meet with my band members and rehearse and then go to the convention and then off to somewhere else after that. So, yeah, it'll be it'll be fun and rewarding 
um, on a, a very deep level, actually, because I haven't seen these people in three years. And, and you know, getting to perform with them is, um, it, it, there's nothing like it. There's just really nothing like it. There really is nothing, nothing like performing in front of an audience. I have yeah, to it's say. different. And I don't do it a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. As we sit in our little home studios here. Uh, so <laughs> how can people find out more information about you, Elaine? <laughs> well, the easiest place to go is podcastallies.com, which is my company website. Mm -hmm. And the Sound Judgment podcast is a page on that website. Um, and I'm Elaine A. Grant on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Okay. Um, but the place there uh, that I am most active when it comes to social media is LinkedIn. Okay. And so just searching for Elaine Appleton Grant on LinkedIn. But of course, you can get to me in any of those places from the website podcastallies.com. Sure. And I'll put yeah. that in the show notes as well. Yeah. Oh, and, thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, how can people find you, Jody? <laughs> Uh, well, I am at voiceoversandvocals.com. And again, the page for the podcast is audiobrandingpodcast.com, which goes to a page on the, the first website that I mentioned. So it's all there. And I am Jody Krangle on all the social medias. Um, LinkedIn is probably the best place to reach me again you can find me by my name, but I'm on Facebook and Twitter. And I'm also uh, testing Mastodon and Post. So oh. these are some interesting places that, you know, they're not quite mainstream just yet, but uh, I'm finding them really interesting. An illustrator, a children's illustrator friend of mine, uh, one of my music partners from way, way back, actually, uh, a woman named Debbie Ridpath Ohi, she's uh, got a post she started working on uh, putting up longer posts that are almost blog-like on post. And uh -huh. post allows you to do things like format what you're putting up there. So you can add bold and underline and italics and stuff like that and use different fonts. And it's actually really an interesting medium that I'm experimenting with. So, yeah. I'm yeah, the that. whole topic of conversation about the podcast community and whether to stay on Twitter or go somewhere else and oh, yeah. where to go. Yeah, yeah. big question. Mastodon seems to be a lot of the place where, where some people are going, but I think post might be a really good option for those who like posting longer posts because mm. Mastodon has a character limit and post kind of really doesn't. So I am watching the development of something new called Spoutable. Oh, interesting. Which is an alternative to those. Okay. Um, which is being developed by a guy who specializes in sort of online safety. Ah, oh, okay. Which I think is very, very important. Very. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see how this develops over time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But thank you so much. This has been the most awesome conversation. <laughs> so much this fun. <laughs> this has been so much fun. Jody. you and I always have a lot to talk about. We I do. love the overlaps between our industries and between our curiosities mm -hmm. and how much I learn from your show that I go, huh, you know, that applies to podcast hosting. And likewise. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to learn in both industries. And I think, as you say, they relate a lot to each other. <laughs> we'll have to do a Twitter space conversation together. I would love that. Anytime. Or a Mastodon space or Clubhouse or <laughs> something, some online conversation uh, you know, somewhere. Yeah, I have Clubhouse conversations on podcasting all the time. So yeah, I would love to do that. <laughs> that would be great. Terrific. Okay. Thanks, Jody. Thank you. I really enjoy that conversation with Jody. If you now want to know more about how sound influences us and how the many different makers in the audio branding world make their work, make sure to follow Jody's show, Audio Branding. I've been listening for the last two years, and I always learn something new. There's a link to it in the show notes. They're on our site, podcastallies.com, along with a full transcript. 
You can watch shorts from Audio Branding on Jody's YouTube channel at Jody Krangle VO. That's Jody with an I, J O D I. At the end of every episode, I give you a few takeaways. Here are today's. One, why does sound matter? Let's take a look at the advertising industry for some clues. They spend millions of dollars crafting the right sounds and voices. Why? because they know that sound can create deeper connections with the audience. We don't buy things because of logic, but because we feel deeply connected to somebody. Brands use sound to communicate something distinct, unique, and ownable. So how are you using audio to create that deeper connection with your audience and to communicate just how special and different you are from the crowd? Two. Storytellers, if you work for an organization or a brand, you may already have a podcast or be thinking about starting one. When you do, make sure it not only integrates with the rest of your communications, but also that it's as high quality as everything else you put out into the world. If I learned anything from talking with Jody, it's that your sonnet brand is worth millions and that audio creates a brand just as much as your visuals do. Three, mindset is a big part of becoming a great host. When she started hosting, Jody, who, as we know, makes her living using her voice, had to overcome one big negative belief. I didn't think I was a speaker of any kind, she told me. It was hard for her to speak her own words, to believe that she had something worth saying, and to be passionate enough to get her thoughts across. That was all harder than she expected, but she persevered. All of this is learnable, and mindset is the first thing we often need to change. That's it for today. Thanks for being with me on Sound Judgment. If you learned something from this two-part episode, please share it with a friend, or even better, give us a short review on Apple Podcasts or shout it out on social media. Everything you do helps our new show grow. Thank you. Sound Judgment is a production of Podcast Allies. It's produced by me, Elaine Appleton Grant. Sound design and editing by production manager Andrew Perella. Our cover art is by Sarah Edgel. Podcast management by Tina Basir. Coming up on the next episode, have you ever wanted to make an audio documentary? They're among the most impactful and award-winning shows out there, and often for good reason. But how do you do it? And how do you sell one? A leader from a top NPR affiliate station talks me through their green light process. And we dissect the making of a This American Life story. <laughs>